Well, hello, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. I know it's lunchtime, so I really appreciate you, I, you all being here. If you made your way to this room, that means you want to hear about uh, how to hack Bluetooth low energy devices. So hopefully I get to answer some of those questions today. Um, my name is Jose Gutierrez. Oh, shit. This is funny. Uh, the title of my presentation is actually uh, How Do I BLE Hacking But Really, Truly Underground? It's called How to Make Nick Cage Rich, Rich Again. And I'll tell you why in a second. Um, my name is Jose Gutierrez. I'm a researcher. Uh, my background is electrical computer engineering. And I like to consider myself a perpetual dabbler. I dabble all over the place. <laughs> um, uh, most recently, I did that. <laughs> Uh, most recently, uh, home automation and definitely Bluetooth low energy, low energy security. Um, our research director is Ben Ramsey. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here today. He's recovering from surgery out east. But um, some of his most recent work is uh, all sorts of Z-Wave stuff, which I know a lot of guys here have worked with. Um, and he's talked at DerbyCon, ShmooCon, and um, he has most recently a POC or GTFO article, which is really cool about uh, ex reading EEPROM and extracting some um, private keys out of it. So it's pretty awesome. Um, all right, cool. So uh, some housekeeping slash expectation management. Uh, what I will be presenting today is a basic, basic overview of how Bluetooth Low Energy works. I'll be talking about some uh, of the most basic Bluetooth Low Energy tools and how to use them and when to use them, most importantly. Um, I won't be presenting an in-depth, you know, down in the weeds Bluetooth Low Energy talk. Uh, I don't have enough time, so go read the specs and you'll get all that information. And I, I'm not going to present every single tool out there. So there's plenty of approaches to do some of the stuff that we've, we're talking about today. But I'm just going to present what we have, we have done, what we've used. Um, some nomenclature. Whenever I say tablet, think mobile. So uh, smartphones, tablets, phablets, whatever it is. Uh, whenever I say Kali, think Linux machine with a Blue Z uh, Bluetooth stack. Okay, so most of, most of the time, you'll be able to do all of these things with those two uh, types of devices. Okay. So let's get started. Um, let's go into a little bit of a story here. We know that Bluetooth Low Energy is a forefront technology um, in smart devices slash IoT, because uh, it's super easy to use. It's super low energy. Um, and we knew that it was pretty um, available, um, but we didn't actually know how much it was being used. Um, people use this on everything. Okay, We're talking like. Um, we're talking uh, smartwatches, outlets, uh, pressure cookers out there you can buy. Um, you can buy a, a, um, a bib and, uh, sorry, what's that called? Pacifier. pacifier, oh my god. Uh, you can buy a pacifier that basically reports on a baby's temperature using Bluetooth Low Energy. There's all sorts of shit out there you can buy, all right? Um, some of them has, some, has, some, has implications, security implications. So there's Bluetooth locks. Um, and actually, one of my co-workers, Anthony Rose, is going to give a talk later today and tomorrow about how to hack Bluetooth Low Energy locks. So if you're interested, go check that out. Um, there's also industrial sensors. So this is a pressure sensor you can go buy online. We decided to focus on a data logger, temperature and humidity data logger, specifically the Onset MX1101. Why did we focus on this? Well, the manufacturer actually is really proud to include some testimonials. Um, this is one of them. So this lady's claiming that she uses this to monitor the temperature and humidity of the Magna Carta, one of the four copies of the Magna Carta in, uh, in England. Um, and there's no way this is actually happening, right? Well, I don't know. I haven't been to England recently. Uh, and I couldn't get them to pay for a trip. But we do know that this picture exists. And this is like a, you know, uh, an, a marketing picture, if you will. But it's her holding an app that's controlling the temperature sensor that's inside the case of the Magna Carta. So there are some the potential implications. So let's talk about uh, this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's how you make him rich again, right? Uh, let's talk about this sensor a little bit more closely. Um, specifically, it's a, it's a data logger. So essentially, you put this thing out there, um, and it just tracks temperature and humidity and just logs it. And you can walk by with a, a companion app to actually pull off that information. Um, there's a password that you can set up on the sensor so that not anybody can walk by and, and pull off your data. Um, and you can also do firmware updates over the air that the manufacturer has enabled on this device, which are both very interesting things that we'll talk about in a little bit. OK, so before we m move on, I want to draw a clear line in the sand between Bluetooth Classic and Bluetooth Low Energy. OK, um, when you hear Bluetooth, it, it kind of covers all of these things. So I, I want to make sure that we're, we're talking about the same thing here. Um, classic is a high overhead, 
fast data rate, something that you might use to listen to music, uh, to make phone calls, right? So your car is using Bluetooth Classic type of communications. Uh, Bluetooth Low Energy is a completely different protocol um, that is designed specifically for low energy transmissions, uh, specifically state full type of transmission. So whether a door is open or closed, whether uh, a light is on or off, or a, com a command to turn a light on or off. So it's very quick, very short bursts of transmissions. And that's what Bluetooth Low Energy is primarily uh, used for. And that's, where, that's the type of uh, communications that we're going to be talking about today. Okay. So our basic hacking process, if you will, kind of follows the traditional hacker's methodology that you can just go Google. Um, basically, you have to find a target first. Then you enumerate its services and characteristics. We'll talk about what those mean. Um, and then we'll, you, you kind of have to reverse the application protocol and, and try to figure out what the application is trying to do, um, specifically like the app on your phone. What's it trying to do when it communicates to the device? Okay. And if you complete these three steps, then you can, of course, uh, do whatever you want. Attack, profit, whatever. Okay. Cool. So step one, select the target. Uh, as of yesterday, there wasn't really a, a clear way to do this. Thanks to uh, Zero and his team, they, they put out a tool called Blue Hydra, which helps you find Bluetooth low energy devices out in the wild. So uh, there you go. Uh, so go download that and use it. If you don't have that, here's some of the other ways that you can do it. Basically, every Bluetooth low energy, de low energy device um, advertises some sort of, some sort of uh, uh, information, specifically advertises connectability. Am I connectable? Um, it advertises uh, optionally available services that it's providing or um, some manufacturer specific data. Okay. So if you can listen to those advertisements, you can generally see that there's a device out there. Your other option is to do a, a scan request. So a scan request is just a broadcast asking for what devices are out and they all respond with, with scan responses. And then there you go. You have what, what devices are out there. Okay. To do it, uh, on a tablet, you can use an app called Light Blue or NRF Connect. If you just download it right now, you can you can find what Bluetooth low energy devices are, are around here. Um, if you're on Cali, you can use uh, HCI Tool. So, anybody heard of HCI Tool? Ever used it? Yeah, right. So it it's, it comes available with a with the Blue Z Bluetooth stack. So you just use it, run an LE scan, and you can see all the the Bluetooth energy devices in the area. If you just want to listen to those advertisements without sending scan requests, you can use the passive option. Now, every time I, anytime I do anything Bluetooth low energy on my Cali box, I have BTMon running on a different window. And BTMon essentially is Wireshark for uh, Bluetooth. So anything that your computer sends down to the Bluetooth dongle and anything that comes back from the dongle back to your machine uh, gets displayed on by BTMon. Actually, and I think Blue Hydra actually uses BTMon and parses BTMon to provide you information about what devices are, are in the area. So, cool, awesome. Okay, if all else fails, you can always use a sniffer. So, we're going to talk about three, three different types of sniffer or three sniffers that are out there. Uh, number one, Ubertooth One. It's probably the most popular one. It's one of the most, um, it's one of the first dongles that could actually sniff Bluetooth classic communications uh, for the cheap. So, uh, it's really. Um, well known and, and widely available, so you can find that for 100, about 100 bucks. Um, if you don't have 100 bucks and you only want to sniff, sniff Bluetooth low energy, de low energy devices, you can use something like the uh, CC2540 eval kit, which actually comes preloaded with a sniffer. And then you just download TI software that to run on your machine that displays all the sniff packets. Or you can uh, use the Bluetooth, or I'm sorry, the Bluefruit LE sniffer, which is about 30 bucks. Um, again, or th these types of sniffers are actually, those two are actually meant for uh, debugging purposes, right? So if you're building a Bluetooth low energy application and you want to know what kind of communications are occurring between your devices and, and uh, like your app and your device or something, these sniffers will help you debug that communication. We're just taking advantage of it because, hell, we, that's the information that we're looking for. So um, you can use those. Now, you might come across packets that are actually encrypted. And this is kind of what an encrypted packet looks like in Wireshark. So most notably, you, you'll see the start encryption request at the top. That kind of, that's kind of a giveaway that the packets are, or the communication was encrypted at uh, the link layer. Um, if you see a lot of L2 cap fragments like that, it also probably means that it's encrypted. So you're not shit out of luck if, uh, if there's encryption. Mike Ryan gave us a tool, called, a tool called Crackle, which takes advantage of a vulnerability that he found um, with the pairing process, if you're using either six-digit pin pairing or just works pairing, um, 
So if you use his tool, you can, and, and you can capture the sniffing process, which only happens once at the very beginning, whenever you first get the device. Um, you capture that, that, that sniff pairing, you, you feed the encrypted traffic to the tool, and out comes that unencrypted traffic. So we've run a lot of this. We've tested this tool, and it works really great if you're using those two types of, uh, either one of those two types of pairing modes. Now, uh, the Bluetooth gods, if you will, put out another type of pairing, um, which actually re was recommended by Mike Ryan, which mitigates this, uh, this attack. But what we found is that actually most devices don't even use link layer encryption um, because you have to pair. So that's harder for the user to do. So they just avoid it altogether. And they either don't encrypt their communication or they encrypt at a higher level, an applica application level, or something like that. Okay. So uh, we actually prefer not to use any sniffers at all if we, if we can avoid it because sniffers still do drop a lot of packets. So what we prefer to do is just, if there's an Android app available for the specific thing that we're trying to interact with, we'll download the Android app, we'll enable uh, developer options, enable that Bluetooth HCI snoop log option, and then it just does the same thing that BTMon does, except for in your Android tablet. So you just pull that file off and you can read it in Wireshark, super easy. So step one was finding devices. Step two, enumerate. We're trying to figure out what service and services and characteristics are running on our target. If you um, want to do it actively, you can use your tablet to connect. So as soon as, as, soon as you connect with NRF Connect or Light Blue, it's just going to tell you what services are available on the device and what characteristics are on there. Um, if you're on Kali, you can use a tool called GAT Tool, which is also included with the Blue Z stack. Um, you can use commands primary and characteristics to get all, the, all of that information. If you want to do it passively, you can always sniff it. So at the very beginning of a, of a Bluetooth connection, you'll see some of these service discovery messages, which essentially is a device talking to each other, saying, hey, I have the, I'm, I'm providing these types of services, and here's my characteristic handles and all that stuff. So at this point, you're probably wondering, uh, what the hell is a service, and what the hell is a characteristic, and why don't you tell me? I will. So I want to do it through an example. So let's, let's pretend that we're working out. Um, I have a, a phone and a heart rate monitor, and essentially my phone is asking my heart rate monitor through Bluetooth Low Energy, um, hey, what's this guy's heart rate? Okay, so this is a type of communication that we might see during a workout. Now, what's actually happening is the heart rate monitor is a Bluetooth Low Energy server, in this case, serving three different services, two that are required by Bluetooth Low Energy that I'm not gonna go into today, um, and one that's application specific, and actually, those, any, any other ones that you see besides those two are going to be application specific. So what's really happening is my phone is contacting the heart rate service inside the Bluetooth Low Energy server and asking for my heart rate. Pull back one layer, really what's happening is my phone is contacting the, the heart rate measurement characteristic inside of, the, inside of the heart rate service asking for my heart rate. You can actually pull one, one more layer back. Um, the BLE client is actually sending a read request to the value attribute inside the heart rate measurement characteristic, inside the heart rate service, inside the Bluetooth Low Energy server. But I've pulled the wool over your eyes because really the Bluetooth Low Energy server is just a list of attributes. Okay, The whole thing is just one giant database of attributes. Now the GAT um, profile is what assigns um, meaning to those attributes. Okay, so it says this is a service or this is a characteristic. So really, uh, at the end of the day, all, all Bluetooth Low Energy communications are reads and writes to these attributes. That's it. That's all it is. So if you can break the communication down to, those, to that level, you know what's going on between the app and the device. Okay? So here's how it looks for the MX1101 data logger that we talked about earlier. Okay? This is literally all of the attributes on that device. The first 11 attributes define those two services that I talked about that we're not gonna talk about for the rest of the talk. The next 11 attributes define the device ID service, which includes stuff like manufacturer name and model number string. This specific service is actually defined by the Bluetooth SIG, the Bluetooth gods, if you will. So these guys took their specs and just applied it here and, cre and created that service on the device. And then the last 11 are actually the application-specific stuff that Onset, the, the manufacturer, developed and put on the server. Okay? And this, the most interesting thing about, about these attributes is the command and control attribute. Okay? So as we'll talk about in a sec, um, they use this one single handle to control it and to pull data off of it. And we'll talk about um, all that in a little bit. Okay, so once you've 
you've you've uh, find your, found your device and you've enumerated all the services and characteristics and found that attribute table, then you have to understand, like I said, what the application is actually doing, how it's communicating with those handles to figure out what kind of data it's pulling, how it's pulling that data, okay? So the strategies for this are endless. I mean, it's just a reversing project. Um, one of our favorite things to do is once you figure out what the, what the handles are and how they relate to services and characteristics, you just impersonate the device. So we pretended after we found that, got that database, we implemented a, our own device with that same database. And then we used the app to communicate with our device. And because of that, we were, we were able to extract a lot of functionality that the app um, had that the device maybe didn't have. So just an interesting thing to do here. Um, so let's talk about the MX1101, our target and Nick's favorite item here. Uh, the password that I talked about that protects your device, it's sent from the app to the device in clear text to that command control handle. Literally just sit here with an Uber tooth and you will know my password, which is ridiculous because that command control handle um, does everything from configuring the device, setting alarms, pulling data off, whatever. And you can do all of it if you've authenticated with the device using the password that, oh, you just sniffed, okay? Now, the most interesting thing for me is the fact that they allow, oh, that, okay. Uh, this is an example. You would send a command to that, to that handle and everything that comes back is data, okay? That's kind of what that looks like. Now, the most interesting thing to me is that you can send a specific command that's just unhandled, right? After you've authenticated, you send a specific command and it just stops logging. It just breaks down, which is a problem because in order to get it to start logging again, you have to reconnect with your app and you have to reconfigure the device and then restart it. And then I'll just do it again. And then you're offline. Cool. Um, but even more interesting than that, you can perform over the air updates. So I thought, well, can I perform over the air update with my own firmware? Um, and this is just as a proof of concept. Remember, I said they had a device information service running in that device. Um, I just changed what the manufacturer name string and model number string were, and then I uploaded my own firmware, and I changed it, right? So proof of concept, you can change, you can add your own firmware to this thing. And actually, um, if, you, if you guys pull out the app right now, you'll see that the device, which is, I meant to pull it out. Huh? <laughs> yeah, right. I'm not Nick Cage, all right? Um, if you guys find this device right now, um, it's actually a heart rate monitor, or it's pretending to be a heart rate monitor. So I, yeah, I literally rewrote the whole firmware for this thing and just added my own whatever the hell I wanted to do. So, so not good. But this is the type of stuff that you'll find out there once you start looking into Bluetooth Low Energy devices. So once you've figured out the application, do something with it, okay? So if you want to write, write stuff on your Kali machine, you can use Scapy, and Scapy has a, a lot of nice libraries that you can just use to send, send write commands and, and read commands and pull data off. Again, all you're doing is interacting with these handles, so as long as you can code that up, you're good to go. Um, if you're on a tablet, you can actually just like pull it up, tap handle 19, tap write this set of hex characters, go. That's it. Now, it, you know, most of these communications will take like 20 or 30 back and forth, you know, handle writings and reads. So you probably want to implement a lot of it on, on, your, on your Kali box if you can. Um, proof of concept, we built a password sniffer and a brute forcer, a uh, password brute forcer. We built a data dumper so you can just pull da data off of that device arbitrarily. Uh, we built that device impersonator that I was talking about earlier. So that's, um, and a firmware uploader. And all those tools are available on our GitHub as proof of concept tools. Um, now you probably don't have an MX1101 to play with, but uh, what you can, if you look through that code, you'll see how we're actually writing to handles and reading from handles, and then you know go forth and conquer. Um, so some more resources for you if you're interested at all in Bluetooth low energy hacking, read the developer's handbook by Robin Hayden. He's one of the original developers for the Bluetooth low energy protocol, and he wrote this book, and it's awesome. So read through it, and it, a lot of this will make more sense. Um, Mike Ryan, the guy who made Crackle, he's done a lot of Bluetooth low energy research that you can go find at his sites. Um, some people to thank, a lot of, some of them in the audience, Ben Ramsey, Anthony Rose, Caleb Mays, Mike Ryan indirectly, the folks at Wireless Village for letting me come here and talk, um, and of course the lady at home. Now, does anybody have any questions for me at this time? Ma'am.
but it's not mandatory for implementation. So is this for products only that don't implement Bluetooth low energy uh, security? Or is it, am I missing something? The, uh, maybe, uh, maybe not, maybe I'm not familiar with it, but the, on, the only security protocol I guess that I would know about is, is the link layer encryption, which is all handled by a security manager service basically. Um, and I, yeah, so I'm not really familiar with, with what you mean, but maybe we can talk offline about it. So. Anybody else? All right, hopefully this was helpful. I'll be around. Um, come ask me questions. Grab me a beer if you want. It'll be cool. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. <laughs>